Good afternoon. Um, I, we are going to be starting our webinar this afternoon, and the title of our webinar is The Nose Unplugged. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Amber Luong. I am an assistant professor at the University of Texas uh, Medical School at Houston. I practice in the Department of Otorhinolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery. Um, and also my colleague, uh, Dr. David Ameth, he is part of the uh, Allergy and Asthma Associates. So today what we'd like to talk to you about is uh, to get an idea about the overview of the anatomy of the nose so that you understand why it is that you're congested. If you can hear me, you can probably tell that I too am suffering from nasal congestion. As, as well as my colleague, um, we're going to review some of the medical therapy for nasal congestion, what you can do about it when you start feeling congested. Uh, and I know that there's a lot of, uh, it's difficult, I know for my husband, when he goes out to the drugstore to find something to help him with a cold or nasal congestion, it's very confusing. So we'd like to go over some of that with you. And then finally, when you think you're suffering from allergies or something simple like nasal congestion and you've tried everything on the market in terms of medicine, when you should consider going to see a doctor and maybe why uh, medicines may not help you completely and maybe surgery may play a role. So I'm just going to start out by discussing and giving you an, an idea of the anatomy of the nose and the sinuses. So the, I just found this kind of funny because so this is how I feel someday. Um, this tree is talking to another tree. You sound a little congested today. Well, I've got a squirrel in my nose, and uh, I, I, at least for today, that's exactly how I feel. Um, so what does the nose and the sinuses do? Well, um, for one, we know that it hel helps us smell. Um, and, uh, of course, that will help us taste our foods. But in addition to that, it helps humidify the air so that when we breathe in the air into our lungs, it's a little bit warmer. It helps filter the air. All that nose hair that we have up front actually helps filter um, some of the larger particles uh, from getting into our lower airway. And even though we don't really know exactly what the role of the sinuses are, uh, we believe that it serves to help the resonance uh, of speech, as well as if you can imagine, we're more important, we're more, uh, the brain is much more an important function for us. And so we believe that the sinuses actually help to buffer any sort of trauma uh, prior to uh, affecting the brain. So the one thing I think that comes to a surprise to a lot of my patients is that they think that the nose, um, number one, goes up as the as you see the bridge on your face, but in fact it goes back. And the other thing that's a surprising to a lot of people is that it's not just an empty tunnel, but in fact it's a very complicated anatomy that's going on inside the nose. So. Um, in the picture here, if you if you were able to see inside your nose, um, we're looking here on the right side nose. The septum separates the right cavity from the left cavity. And also, you have these outpouchings um, called turbinates. And there's three sets, usually. This is the inferior turbinate, which you could actually see if you went to a mirror and looked up into your nose at this uh, from the mirror. And then also, a little bit further back is the middle turbinate. And then finally, there's another one a little bit further back called the superior uh, turbinate. And the idea for these turbinates um, is that it increases the surface area to allow our nose to humidify and warm up the air. In addition, there is uh, just underneath this inferior turbinate is where your tear ducts drain. So it's a very uh, complicated and interesting anatomy despite the initial uh, perception. So what about the nose and its relationship to the sinuses, um, and, and how, how are they related? Well, basically, what I like to explain to my patients uh, is the fact that there are four sets of sinuses, and they're all relative to your eye. Uh, the one below your eyes, uh, or on your cheeks, are called the maxillary sinus. And we can see that here on this CAT scan uh, on this slide, and it's depicted here on this CAT scan. The nasal cavities are right in the center, and these are those turbinates I was showing you on that previous uh, slide. And these are the cheek sinuses or the maxillary sinuses that lie uh, underneath the eyes. And then there's the ethmoid sinuses. They are in between the eyes and not on this slide. Um, uh, is uh, There are some frontal sinuses that are above your eyes. And then finally there are a pair of sinuses that live behind your eyes called the sphenoid sinus. 
All of these sinuses ultimately drain into the nasal cavity. Um, the other thing that you should be aware is that our sense of smell. The nerves actually come out uh, of the brain into the nasal cavity, kind of on the roof of the nasal cavity, and that allows you to have a uh, be able to smell. And then finally, the other thing is that the nasal cavity is very rich in blood vessels, and hence why it's very easy to have nosebleeds. So I'm going to switch it over to my colleague, Dr. Anmuth, and who will talk to you about the medical aspect. Hello, everyone. Again, uh, I think uh, Dr. Luong's voice actually sounds a little bit clearer than mine, so hopefully we'll get through this all right. Um, and again, we'll probably talk a lot about the, uh, the things that cause my voice to be hoarse uh, as well. So again, the topic that we're talking about is nasal congestion. But nasal congestion as a whole is just a symptom of an underlying diagnosis. That usual diagnosis, uh, most commonly, is, is considered to be rhinitis. And rhinitis um, are the symptoms that are produced by the irritation or the inflammation which are in your nose. Uh, it's very, very common here in the United States um, and worldwide. Uh, and, and in the U.S., about 10 to 30 percent of adults are affected, but more so about 40 percent of children. The two major variations of rhinitis, one being allergic, the other being non-allergic. When you first talk about allergic rhinitis, which I think a lot of people um, know uh, a lot about, um, it's caused by things in the air. So allergens um, in the air um, that are normally harmless to most people um, can cause problems in those people who are allergic. Usually what happens is an overreaction of the immune system who produce uh, an antibody called immunoglobulin E, uh, which travels to certain cells that then release chemicals resulting in the symptoms that is perceived as allergy. So anywhere from sneezing, itching, stuffy nose or congestion, a runny nose, itchy eyes, uh, and of course a post-nasal drip. In terms of allergic rhinitis, there are two causes. The first being outdoor allergens, which most people are familiar with. So there are three types of outdoor allergens that might affect people the trees, the weeds, and the grasses. And above that list, you can see a website. So if you do live in the Houston area, um, you can follow the pollen counts on a daily basis. And so the pollens usually change with given seasons. And so right now is the fall season. And in the fall, the biggest uh, problem are weeds, most commonly ragweed. So ragweed season, what I usually tell my patients is usually about Labor Day through Thanksgiving is the time that ragweed might affect someone. The winter is usually kind of a benign season, doesn't usually have too many allergies. But then once the spring hits around uh, Valentine's Day uh, in, here in Houston and through Memorial Day is the tree season. So especially in the, in the Houston area, the oak trees, the ash trees, um, pecan trees will give people a lot of problems. The grasses may bloom uh, or give people problems at the end of spring um, and through summer. Um, but here in Houston, it's quite warm most of the time. And so grasses can cause problems um, at most of the times in the year. The indoor allergens, or what's commonly called the perennial allergic rhinitis, are things that might be around all the time. So pets, being cats, dogs, hamsters, what have you, um, might be an irritant to somebody all, all the time. Molds, which can be outdoor or indoor. The dust mites, which are mostly indoor, and as well as cockroaches, which can also cause allergic problems. Other causes of rhinitis, which uh, other than allergic rhinitis, are considered to be non-allergic in nature. These are, 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 there are many causes, most commonly being infections. Other uh, problems might be irritants, which are smoke uh, or ozone, chemicals in the air, uh, strong odors, anything that might cause you to have allergic-like symptoms um, just by being irritating. Change in weather or temperature changes can cause uh, congestion or runny nose, depending on uh, which way you're going. Some medications may have side effects. Um, and then there's also drug-induced congestion. And so uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the, in the upcoming slides. Infections, as we said, is the probably number one cause of non-allergic problems. It is commonly called the common cold um, and is the most common condition causing rhinitis on, as a whole. It's usually short-lived, except if you've got my cold, which has been dragging on for uh, a week or two. Um, the, uh, it's caused by any number of hundreds of viruses. 
and uh, and children are especially susceptible and can get from eight to twelve infections per year. And a common thing I tell my patients of, of children who get sick all the time is that children can have between eight and twelve infections a year. Each of them can last a, about a week to two weeks um, long and if your child is the child that gets twelve infections all lasting two weeks each time they're sick twenty four weeks out of the year and unfortunately uh, that is com considered to be normal. Uh, it's not fun and you may miss a lot of work as a parent but it's still considered on the spectrum of normal. So let's talk a little bit more about the common cold. Uh, it usually has a specific progression um, in most people. So it may start with congestion, then progress to some runny nose and sneezing. The congestion may then worsen. The mucus um, may start to change colors. It may start to as clear and then start to get thicker and uh, and change colors on you. Maybe you know some yellow or green. There may be a fever uh, at some point in the progression. But again, the symptoms should resolve over the next week or two. The cold symptoms that last longer than that may be due to other causes, and that's probably a good time uh, to see your doctor. An interesting thing that I think patients often uh, tell doctors, um, which is always concerning to them, is the color of their mucus. And so they come in and they might say, my mucus is yellow, my mucus is green, um, and that, uh, that they have an infection. And that is true. You probably do have some sort of infection, but oftentimes it's, it's difficult to differentiate whether that infection is caused by a virus or a bacteria. And so if the color of the mucus has changed just after a couple of days, more than likely it's just a viral cause. It just has, uh, it, it tells us that there are certain cells that are fighting off the infection, um, changing the color and the texture of the, of the mucus. If that color lasts or persists for several weeks to months, then it may be more uh, of a bacterial cause that might require antibiotics or other type of treatments. Rhinitis medicamentosa is a fancy word uh, basically for being addicted to a nasal decongestant. Um, congestion uh, is oftentimes uh, difficult to treat um, and, and, and a medicine that works quite well uh, is a medicine called Afrin or that's the, the common uh, brand name that you might see but the uh, generic name is called oxymetazoline. Uh, and it's, it's a nasal decongestant but it works very, very quickly unlike uh, a lot of other medicines. If used longer uh, for periods of time, uh, more than uh, probably uh, five days or so, um, you it, people use it for weeks at a time, and what happens is the only thing that works is the medicine. And so over time, the uh, the nasal tissues swell after the medication wears off, and that the only relief will come if the if the patient uses more and more medicine. And so over time, the effectiveness of that medicine wears off, and 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 you need more and more a med medicine um, to to reduce the congestion and that's when addiction occurs and so for people that do use these medicines we just need to be very careful and only use them for brief periods of time to help improve uh, acute symptoms. So let's talk a little bit more about the medication classes and again Dr. Luong sort of hinted that we were going to try and help you pick the proper medicines um, for you when you do get some symptoms. I think a really common medicine are antihistamines, um, oral or nasal and we'll talk more about those we're going to talk mostly about over-the-counter things that you can buy. Um, the other medications you might hear of are leukotriene inhibitors. So some of you might be on Singulair, uh, which is a common medicine. The nasal steroids, which are classes of uh, like Flonase or Nasonex or Nasacort, um, and they are prescriptions. The nasal decongestants, again, similar to uh, what we just talked about, the nasal decongestant, but there's also oral decongestants. The expectorants and mucolytics the cough suppressants, and then good old nasal saline. And so I think we underestimate the powers of just washing out your nose with, uh, with nasal saline. So let's first look at the antihistamines. There are a lot of antihistamines. Um, the oral antihistamines come in sort of two flavors, one being the first generation and the other being the second generation. The first generation I think uh, people um, are very familiar with and is commonly known as Benadryl, which is probably the most popular first generation antihistamine and there are others on that list uh, to your left as well. The problems with uh, first generation antihistamines is that one is that may make people quite sleepy often um, and that their effectiveness is usually short lived so they might only last you maybe four to six hours in length. The second generation antihistamines try and take out that uh, sedative property um, and don't cause um, as much sleepiness um, but yet there is some of them, like Zyrtec, which might cause a, a small amount, but not nearly um, as much as its uh, predecessor of hydroxyzine. 
the second generations, again, as you can see on the right, there's Zyrtec, Allegra, Claritin, um, and, and Zizol. So those will also last you a little bit longer um, and hopefully almost get a 24-hour duration um, in terms of covering your symptoms. The nasal antihistamines are prescription only, and those two, one is called um, azelastin, the other is olipatidine, and their brand names are either Aslan or Astapro and Patinase. The decongestants, the nasal decongestants, we've already kind of gone through, again, brand names, Afrin, four-way spray, um, some Vicks brands. Again, there's a lot of different um, flavors, but again, as you, when you look at it, the generic name is oftentimes the same. The oral decongestants uh, usually are about two different flavors. Phenylephrine uh, is one, the uh, more commonly uh, Sudafed, um, which you might find uh, behind the counter is the pseudoephedrine. The phenylephrine usually you can find um, in front of the pharmacy counter. When you talk about expectorants and cough suppressants, and so an expectorant is something that will help to sort of thin the mucus. Um, so if you've got a cough or you've got mucus, you want to try and thin that mucus to help it drain um, and reduce some of your coughs. So the most common, I think, these days is guaifenesin, often known as mucinex. But again, it's very similar to robitussin is also um, guaifenesin as well. So again, the generic names are oftentimes the same. The brand names are what change. And so oftentimes look at the brand name, but look specifically at the generic name of what makes up that medicine. A cough suppressant um, is the most common, I think, over-the-counter is dextromethorphan, um, oftentimes called Delsum. But again, when you look at the, the names of the medicine, so if you combine Delsum with plain old Mucinex, you get Mucinex DM. And so what we want to encourage everyone is to just be careful of what you buy and not to duplicate medicines um, and just look what ingredients are in the packages. So what medicine should you choose? So again, think of the symptoms that you're having and then try and pick the correct medicine. So if you're just having clear drainage, sneezing, and some itchy nose, it sounds like you might just have plain allergies and an antihistamine might be effective. If you've got color drainage and a post-nasal drip, an expectorant might be helpful, so something like mucinex or guaifenesin. If you've got a hacking cough, you might need a cough suppressant and something like dextromethorphan. If you've got drainage in a cough, using something like Mucinex DM to combine the two ingredients might be the most effective medicine. If you've got pressure, pain, uh, and congestion, again, using the nasal decongestants in addition to a possible pain reliever like Tylenol or Advil or ibuprofen um, may be helpful. The last thing we're going to talk about is immunotherapy. So immunotherapy are basically allergy shots, as commonly known as. The, the, the treatment uh, for severe allergic rhinitis um, or ongoing allergies that just aren't well uh, managed with medications, um, we can use allergy shots. They're not a candidate for, for allergy shots if you don't have any allergies. The way they work is that they're given over periods of time, but it's a long-term treatment course. It's, it gets to the basic root of the problem instead of treating the symptoms. And so what it's hopeful is that over time that you can desensitize the body in terms of the harmfulness of the given allergens that are in the air and that the body doesn't react the same way over time. But it's not a quick fix and we usually do this over about three to five years to teach your body uh, that, that what you think is harmful is not so harmful. So in summary, from a medical side, Nasal congestion, again, is a symptom of an underlying diagnosis. Rhinitis is commonly associated with this nasal congestion. There are two forms of rhinitis, again, allergic and non-allergic, and to control symptoms, it's important to have the right diagnosis. So again, there are a lot of medicines to treat nasal symptoms, and I think by seeing your doctor, they may be able to tell you which one you have, and then you might be able to choose the proper medications for you and make you feel a little bit better. In terms of further education, um, you can be directed towards um, the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, as well as the College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. I'm now going to pass the microphone back um, to Dr. Luong, who's going to talk about what happens when medications don't seem to work any longer. So um, I'm back, and I also wanted to mention that uh, I see that there are a couple of questions coming up. We'd like to hold off answering these questions until the end of the presentation. So if you just uh, bear with us, um, let me get through the rest of the presentation, and then we will address those questions at that time. So 
the next part of the presentation is basically, let's say that uh, you you've gone to you've you you thought it was allergies initially or a cold, and you've gone to the pharmacy and you've tried a number of different things, um, and it's been a couple of weeks or so, and none of these antihistamines or nasal saline sprays decongestants are working for you, but yet you can you still can't breathe out of one nose. What else could be going on? And at this point, I think that as Dr. Ameth had alluded to is when you would consider going to see a physician to see, you know, what else that could, could be contributing to your nasal congestion. <laughs> So the very, very common uh, physical uh, and anatomical variation is a deviated septum, or when that middle part of the nose that separates the right cavity from the left cavity is more skewed towards one side versus the other. Here's a picture of a woman. You're kind of looking up her nose here. and You can clearly see that the septum is deviated towards the left-hand side. And it wouldn't be surprising if she said that, um, that she would have difficulties breathing from her her left side more than the right, and it be, may become more accentuated when she catches a cold or during her allergy season, should she have allergies. Now, why do these happen? Um, it could be from another uh, a number of different reasons, uh, prior nasal surgery, congenital. Some people are born with um, a deviated septum, and sometimes from trauma. And even trauma of being delivered from the birth canal can give you a, a deviated septum. Um, and here's a picture of a more significant deviated septum as you look more into the nasal cavity. And here's an x-ray of how uh, the septum can be quite deviated towards the left in this case. Now, in some people, even if you have a deviated septum, if you're not symptomatic from it, that doesn't necessarily indicate that you have to have anything done for it. It's only if you start having symptoms. And so what is available? Unfortunately, if it's an anatomical pr uh, problem, you can envision that medicines would not help in that situation. And in that scenario, if you're having significant nasal congestion, more so on one side versus the other, then uh, you're... Um, uh, physician, surgeon, would uh, may potentially recommend that you undergo a septoplasty. And what that is, is it's a surgery that's done inside the nose. There's an incision made inside the nose where you basically elevate this uh, soft lining of the nasal cavity uh, so that you can get down to the cartilage and bone. You remove the part that's deviated, and then you close the incision site. And then you're left with uh, the picture on the far right bottom where you can now look straight down into that nasal cavity. And you can uh, imagine why the breathing is, uh, is much better uh, for this patient. Turbinate hypertrophy. Um, this is a common finding that we see in our patients who suffer from rhinitis or inflammation of the nose. It can happen due to allergic rhinitis or um, more so with allergic rhinitis, but it can also uh, be common in patients who suffer from rhinitis or just irritation of the nasal cavity. Um, if you remember from those brief slides that I showed uh, at the beginning, this is a normal turbinate uh, looking in the right nasal cavity. This is the septum here on the right side of this picture. Picture. And when uh, and then now we've switched over to the the left nose. Here's the septum here, and you can see how this turbinate is significantly uh, larger than uh, the turbinate shown on the right picture. And you can see how this would obstruct your ability to breathe through your nose. So what can we do about it? In some situations, uh, nasal steroid sprays can help reduce that inflammation in your nose. Again, that's a prescription. Um, but uh, in some cases, uh, the medicines could work very effectively. In some situations, however, uh, you may require undergoing what's known as a turbinoplasty. And basically, in that situation, what we're trying to do is to remove some of that engorged tissue uh, along the nasal turbinate. So here in this picture, you're seeing the bone of that uh, outpouching of the turbinate. And here is trying to show you the tissue that's inflamed. And what we do, there's a number of different ways to approach this. But basically, we are going underneath the outside lining of this tissue and removing uh, the underlying inflamed tissue, uh, again, to shrink up that nasal turbinate and to allow you to breathe better through your nasal cavity. 
Now, when you go in to see a, uh, your physician, especially if you go to see an ear, nose, and throat doctor, oftentimes the initial evaluation will involve what's called a nasal endoscopy, where basically we have various different cameras. This shows you a picture of a rigid camera looking inside the nose. And you can see here, here's the physician uh, standing to the side of, of the patient. And this is one of our rigid cameras. But you can see that the physician can see uh, the, the, what's going on inside the nose. Uh, on this uh, TV camera here. Uh, this is a nasal endoscopy that's rigid, but we also have flexible endoscopies. And again, the idea is to help us see uh, not only the front part of the nasal cavity that may be giving you difficulties, but also further back that we may not be appreciate with uh, other means of, of looking inside the nose. Now here's a picture of a nasal endoscopy that one, uh, one would undergo in the uh, an ENT clinic. Uh, basically, you can see here, we can go f way far back. You can see there's a little bit of a spur on the septum um, right here. There's the middle turbinate, and it, the camera is taking us all the way back. This is the general opening where the sinuses are. This is the right nose. And so although this patient has not had sinus surgery, this is the general area where the sinuses drain here. This is a suction being introduced to this area. And if you're having a sinus infection, we would be able to appreciate pus uh, coming out of that general area. So another cause of uh, nasal congestion could be not only is the inferior turbinate enlarged, but also the middle turbinate, which is a little bit more further back in the nose. And here is a picture of an enlarged nasal turbinate. And sometimes what happens is that instead of just being one bone, uh, during development it could become what's known as pneumatized or filled with air. And basically it just takes up a lot of space in the nasal cavity. And uh, unfortunately, this would not respond to any medicine, and, but the surgery would involve uh, removing uh, this portion of the bone, giving you more room to breathe. So in our patients who have severe allergies or nasal congestion, this is just a picture of what we might see on a CAT scan. You can see here the enlarged inferior turbinates. These are ones right here. And you can see that sometimes they can get so big that they're touching the septum, which is in the middle part here of this CAT scan. But when we look with our nasal endoscopy, uh, this is that middle turbinate uh, uh, that I was showing. Sometimes you can see, if they're very swollen, that there's evidence of inflammation within the sinuses. And so you could feel nasal congestion, but it may be more than just inflammation limited to the nasal cavity, but rather we might be worried about what's known as chronic rhinosinusitis or, or inflammation of not only the nasal cavity, but also the sinus cavity. And in this situation, you're having, uh, you can have an acute sinus infection, um, as some of us experience, that goes away in about uh, 7 to 10 days. Or you can have this entity called chronic rhinosinusitis, where it's lasting for three months or longer. Basically, some of the symptoms are facial pain and pressure, congestion, obstruction, discharge, uh, discolored, uh, purulence. And some other minor symptoms could be headaches or fevers, uh, bad breath, uh, fatigue, dental pain. And in addition to those symptoms that are lasting for three months or longer, there's also evidence on either that nasal endoscopy or a CAT scan that shows inflammation within the sinus cavity. And that's how we make a, a diagnosis of chronic sinus disease. So here's a, just an example of a typical CAT scan uh, of someone who has suffered from chronic rhinosinusitis. And unlike the other scans that I've shown you, where it's black, uh, like air filled up in the sinuses, this uh, poor patient has either inflammation or fluid stuck in their sinuses and causing them a lot of not only nasal congestion, but a lot of pain and, and pressure. So the typical management for chronic rhinosinusitis would be um, <clears throat> an extended course of antibiotics, nasal steroid spray. You try to control some of the symptoms as, uh, uh, as what Dr. Ameth had talked about, the antihistamines uh, for the drainage or the itchiness, especially in our allergic patients, mucolytics to help thin out the, the, the thick mucus, uh, nasal saline sprays or irrigations to help your nose try to clear out some of this thick mucus. 
this. And that's what we will do um, for the initial treatment. But in some patients with chronic rhinosinusitis, it can be very severe, and they don't respond to the medicines. And, in, and this is a, a picture of a, a poor girl who presented in my clinic who complained of not only nasal congestion, but just um, inability to uh, smell or, or um, breathe out of her nose. And you can see just looking up in her nose that there's these polyps that are inside of her nose. So in a small percentage of patients who have chronic sinus disease, it could be so severe that you get these polyp structures actually growing out of your sinuses into your nasal cavity, causing, as you can imagine, pretty severe nasal congestion. And unfortunately, in those patients, it can be so complicated that uh, over time, if it's not addressed, can cause erosion into the skull base. This is a, another CAT scan here, uh, separating out the brain from the sinus cavity. And I think uh, you can even appreciate that this uh, blockage of the sinus cavities, these are those ethmoid sinuses in between the two eyes here, has uh, been going on for so long that it's actually pushing up the skull base into the brain. So it's critical that, um, you know, that this, you know, you be seen if you've been having symptoms, especially for several months at a time. And some of the medicines that we do utilize, uh, a very common one is pregnazone. It's very effective in patients with chronic uh, rhinosinusitis, especially in those patients with nasal polyps. Um, unlike uh, the nasal steroid sprays, if you have polyps, it's very difficult for those nasal steroids to get all over the sinus cavity. And so in that situation, you do have to take a medicine that you have to take by mouth. Uh, of course, uh, pregnazone does not uh, come without uh, potential adverse effects with it. Uh, and the one that we concern about are effect, detrimental effects to your bone. Um, they can also cause bumps in your blo uh, blood sugar level. So these are things that your physician should talk to you in detail before uh, embarking on a course of nasal steroids, I mean, a course of systemic steroids. And finally, in those chronic rhinosinusitis patients who fail medical therapy, that's when we may start discussing uh, functional endoscopic sinus surgery, or FES. Um, it's often done uh, with the assistance of a navigation tower. You can maybe make out this is the patient. Um, this is the surgeon here. Uh, the patient's feet is towards here. And then there's a head piece that's on top of this patient. And uh, over here where you can't see, there's a navigation system. So we use kind of like a, C a GPS uh, system to help us confirm that where we think we are is in fact where we are as, since we are operating in between the eyes and underneath the brain. And the goal of this type of surgery is to aerate your sinuses, to drain those sinuses from all of the things that have been obstructed or, or not draining um, from it. And then it also allows you as the patient to now be able to do medicines at home to apply steroids or antibiotics or, or, or other things that your physician may recommend. Uh, directly to your sinus cavity through various different irrigations. And what's nice is that the surgery is not done without w is done without any facial incisions. So I just wanted to go real briefly of some uh, things that can also cause nasal congestion uh, that need immediate, uh, or not immediate, but need surgical attention that won't respond to medicines at all. Uh, these are, one is a unilateral polyp or an antroquinal polyp. These are polyps that are not due to uh, chronic rhinosinusitis per se, uh, but their uh, inflammation inflammation coming out of just the maxillary sinus here, and they can often grow into the nasal cavity. This is the right nose with the middle turbinate here, and here's a polyp just growing into the nasal cavity, and it can actually grow into the back of the nose. And again, surgery is required for this particular uh, disease entity. And of course, the things that we worry about that is very, very uncommon is uh, malignant tumors. Uh, so uh, these are quite rare, but uh, you can have squamous cell cancers. Uh, the risk factor is smoking. And, and again, these patients complain of nasal obstruction that do not get any better with any medicines at all, as you would expect. There are some other tumors here, also very rare, um, but they can grow quite rapidly. So again, it's very important that if medicines have failed you, that you go in to see a physician to, to make that proper diagnosis as what Dr. Ampeth has re referred to. So in summary, there are multiple causes of nasal congestion and some that do not resolve uh, with uh, medical therapy 
And so in those situations, it's important to see your physician. And some of the diagnoses that may be entertained might be a septal deviation, turbinate hypertrophy, a chronic rhinosinusitis, or potentially uh, sinonasal tumors. So at this time, we'd like to go ahead and try to address some of these questions. Um, in, give me just a few minutes as we pull up these questions, and then we will uh, answer them one by one. All right, we're going to start with uh, going down the line on the questions. So we'll try and read the question um, and so you guys know what we are talking about. Um, the first question is, why is it that as I've aged, my allergies have progressively gotten worse? Is there anything I can do to help stop them from progressing? Um, I guess it often, I guess it, it, uh, it we have to answer how, how old um, you, you're getting. Um, Certain, certainly, uh, as allergies can, can worsen um, over time. Um, they can come at any time. And so I get a lot of people who, you know, never had any allergies. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, when they're 30 or they're 40, they start to develop um, symptoms. And so there's no sort of uh, age range um, that allergies affect. Oftentimes we do see it early on, um, but it is uh, is possible to get allergies um, that, that worsen with age. Uh, in addition, and depending on, again, how, how old is um, you, you, you are, is that sometimes with, uh, with getting older, um, there's a, a large non-allergic uh, component um, to, to drainage and, uh, um, and allergy-like symptoms that might not necessarily be allergies, but more of a non-allergic uh, cause. Um, but again, in, in order to assess that, you probably need to talk um, with your physician. So this is a question from Lucy. The question is, are there any irrigation systems you recommend? Oops, let me finish. Um, sorry. Are there any irrigation systems you recommend over the other? So um, there are a couple of irrigation systems out uh, on the market. Um, the most common one is the bottle irrigation. I think it's provided uh, only by Neil Med, but they have a number of different ways of delivery. There is the bottle squirt irrigation. Um, they also have a neti pot formulation. Um, and also there are some water picks, or maybe some physicians may recommend a water pick type of device to sort of power spray your nose. And then if you go and see a, a uh, an ENT physician, there are some other uh, devices out there as well that require uh, more of a prescription, not really an irrigation, but a means of providing medication through saline irrigations. Um, these are more like nebulizers, uh, powered nebulizers. So there's a number of couple of different systems out there. Frankly, I don't think that there's any one that's better than the other. There's a couple of studies out there showing that the nasal bottle irrigation system is quite effective and getting into your sinuses. Um, the neti pot, uh, there's been less studies with the neti pot, but that too is also a very effective way of getting solutions into your sinus cavity. Um, the other ones, uh, as I mentioned, the nebulizer or the water pick, I would probably discourage the use of a water pick because if it's not cleaned properly or managed properly, um, it can introduce uh, molds and other things into your sinus cavity. So um, I usually would recommend the uh, water bottle or the neti pot. And then if you are a patient who's had sinus surgery, we need to introduce uh, antibiotics or other medications to your sinuses. Uh, at that time, I might recommend using like a nebulizer system, but again, those aren't uh, uh, commercially available at this point.
I think the next one we're going to look at um, comes from Fred, and it says, uh, can there be significant post-nasal drip without any nasal symptoms, and what's a common cause of this? Um, I think we see this uh, off oftentimes. Um, and yes, you can have a significant post-nasal drip without nasal symptoms, um, which can be caused uh, by allergies. But oftentimes what we see is um, sometimes a post-nasal drip um, that doesn't come with nasal symptoms can oftentimes be reflux. Um, and I think that that's, uh, it's, it's hard to understand that sometimes reflux can come all the way up. Um, I think we always think that the mucus is coming down versus um, reflux coming up. And so, again, talking to your, your doctor about, you know, what the symptoms are <clears throat> and what medicines you've tried um, might be helpful in terms of uh, helping you out with that. Okay, this is another question from Lucy. Uh, her question is, I have a friend that has had polyps removed surgically twice now. Is there a more permanent solution for her? So this is actually quite a complicated question. Um, nasal polyps can recur. Um, however, the goal would be if you go, um, if you're being monitored uh, carefully by your uh, your uh, physician surgeon, um, then you we can sometimes catch these nasal polyps recurring before they require surgery. And in that situation, if they start coming back, we can try um, systemic steroids. Um, if they're really bad, we can uh, we can do steroids. Or if they've only started to come back, then um, the one nice thing, if you've had surgery before, now it allows us to uh, provide medications directly onto the sinus cavity, so we can put steroids into the irrigation system that you're utilizing, or in the clinic, we can provide steroids in a gel. We can do that topically uh, in the clinic, so the gel sticks onto the inflamed tissue for several days, and then you restart your irrigation. Um, so there's different formulations that will allow us to put the, the steroids directly on the polyps to help kind of reduce the inflammation and hopefully prevent these polyps from coming back. Um, if it gets severe, as I said, there are some systemic uh, steroids that we can utilize, but in some situations, they do come back pretty quickly and they don't or they don't respond to the medications that we've tried and in that situation they may require another surgery but if you're asking is there a cure for chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps unfortunately there is no cure and none of our medicines that we have available are curative they're merely um, helps with the symptoms The next question that we're going to look at uh, comes from Robert and says, can you tell me which medication for grass allergies has the best impact versus side effects? And so allergies um, as a whole, in terms of the medicines, the medicines don't discriminate what you're allergic to. So um, you might be allergic to grass or weeds or trees or what have you. If, you t if it's truly caused by an allergy, then the antihistamines um, should work. And so for, there's not one medicine that, that's in particular that you would choose for uh, grass per se. Um, and so I, I, I think depending on how severe the allergies are, an antihistamine is always a, a good choice. And so those are over-the-counter whether it be Zyrtec, Allegra, Claritin, um, or the first generations, Benadryl, things like that, um, are always a good start. Uh, and if they don't work, then again, seeing your doctor for some of the prescription medicines, whether it's the nasal steroids like Flonase or Nasonex or something like that, um, or the nasal antihistamines. We have another question. Um, are antibiotics usually needed for acute sinusitis? Um, so acute sinusitis, uh, that lasting for less than seven days, seven to ten days, still most of them, similar to the cold, is due to viruses. And in that situation, no, uh, antibiotics would not be indicated. However, if your symptoms have either getting, instead of getting better, uh, are getting worse, or they last for two weeks or more, then at that point I would recommend, uh, obviously my uh, bias is to uh, see a physician who can do a nasal endoscopy or who can then get cultures uh, from your sinuses rather than just um, just 
kind of uh, putting you on antibiotics. However, uh, if your symptoms have been going on for two weeks or more and you have a persistent drainage, uh, discolored drainage from your sinuses, in that situation, antibiotics may be indicated. And usually what we like to do as ENT physicians is to obtain cultures that then allow us to choose the most appropriate antibiotic. I think this next question is a good question from Neil, and let me uh, let me read it out to you guys. Um, he asks, "I'd like to take my five-year-old to be tested for allergies. <clears throat> if you guys are familiar, can you describe what the process is like? Could testing for kids different for allergies, um, or testing for different allergies? He doesn't like needles, of course. I'm not sure what five-year-old does. Um, and and Neil relates. He says, when he went in many years ago, he had his arm pricked uh, with a needle. Is that the only way? Um, and so I I can't necessarily speak um, for uh, <laughs> um, for for every allergist. I can." Sorry, a little technical difficulties. Hopefully we're back on. Um, we were talking about allergy testing, um, specifically in children. Um, and so personally, um, and again, the, the most common type of allergy testing and that most uh, allergists use are, uh, are allergy skin prick testing. Um, it does not involve needles. It's actually um, more of a, of a plastic um, sort of uh, toothpick-like device, depending on what the the um, the allergist uh, chooses. Some of them are multi-headed. Um, some of them are single-headed. Um, but they're not necessarily needles. They're more of a of a plastic um, device. And so for me, most children do absolutely fine. Uh, I think the biggest problem that we see is, is that they that they won't sit still or it, if, it, if it's actually positive it's usually pretty itchy. Um, some allergists might use um, needles uh, depending uh, in what tests positive or, or negative and so I guess I always encourage people to, I guess to call um, whoever you're going to see um, and ask what their uh, what their policies are and uh, and so you'll know before before you go what uh, what you'll be comfortable with. So another question is, uh, is there any relationship uh, between strep throat uh, and acute sinusitis? And basically, um, if you know that you have a strep throat, strep throat is where it's an infection of the back of the throat due to a bacteria called strepno, uh, uh, strep pneumococcus. Now, um, can that result into a sinus infection um, it, yes, it could potentially uh, cause uh, another infection of your sinuses, but strep throat is basically a bacterial infection of the back of the throat and does not necessarily uh, translate into a sinus infection. However, that same bacteria causing strep throat is a very common bacteria to cause acute sinusitis that is bacterial related. Um, so, uh, so there is a relationship, but it doesn't mean that if you have strep throat, you will definitely develop a, a a bacterial sinus infection due to strep. The next one we're going to go with is, uh, is from Lyle. It talks about how his allergies were really bad over the past three months here in Houston because it's been pretty dry and he's had bloody noses and he's having a blow his nose a lot and that could that be causing the blood? Um, absolutely. Uh, the interesting thing uh, about the past few months, um, not more recently, within the past couple weeks there have been some allergies but over the past couple of months because it's been so hot and so dry is that nothing has been able to really bloom um, here in Houston so if you look around us um, most everything is 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 cracked and and, and dead and so pure pure allergy um, for the past uh, summer was actually quite low um, but as we talked about before the non-allergic symptoms can certainly be um, caused by by the dryness or other sort of irritating things that might be um, 
um, in the air. And so for um, an easy solution or a, to try for some some bleeding of the nose, it might be just some some of the nasal saline, whether you you know the washes or gels, um, just to kind of uh, lubricate um, your uh, nasal mucosa. Um, I don't know if, if Dr. Long has any more comments on uh, on helping to reduce uh, some some uh, nosebleeds with uh, dry air. No, that's exactly what I recommend. Uh, nasal saline sprays to keep uh, to keep it uh, moist, and you can also use Aquaphor, which is purchased over the counter. It's more of an ointment that you can apply to that septum. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a lot of uh, overlapping blood supply within uh, the nose, and then the the lining of the nose, especially on the septum, is very thin. So you've got all of these blood vessels there, and the lining can be very thin. So it's very easy to crack, just like your skin can crack. Um, and then the problem is that it's so vascularized that it tends to bleed. So you can put this aquaphor right there on that septum with uh, a cotton swab, um, and it works very well. Okay, so we've got uh, one other question. Um, in Houston, uh, since you take cultures, what have you found to be most commonly useful antibiotic, and would clarithromycin usually work if sensitive to uh, if you're sensitive to penicillin? Um, so, um, so this is kind of a a loaded question, but basically um, the most common things for acute sinusitis are strep. Uh, uh, H flu, and then the things that are you think about for chronic sinus infections or people who suffer from chronic sinus infections are more staph uh, type of uh, uh, pseudomonas types of bacteria. Now, if it is an acute sinus infection, the antibiotic that is considered a first-line antibiotic would be something like amoxicillin or Augmentin. Um, if you've had an antibiotic recently and we're concerned about a resistant strain, um, the if you are allergic to it, then we would recommend something in the fluoroquinolones or the levoquin. You mentioned uh, clarithromycin. That's a, usually an antibiotic that is offered. It can be offered, um, but it is typically offered in patients who suffer from chronic rhinosinusitis, uh, chronic rhinosinusitis but may be used to sort of um, suppress the immune response as well. So th you may have had a physician tell you that I'd like you to put you on clarithromycin for maybe uh, 21 days or, or three weeks worth, and that's what they're trying to do. So there's a number of different antibiotics. I would say that amoxicillin augmentin is probably the most common ones, and then levoquin uh, after, as a second line choice. I think we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, this one comes, uh, again, from Fred, is the value of nasal antihistamines and the side effects. We touched a little bit about um, nasal antihistamines. Uh, I don't get too many uh, side effects from nasal antihistamines, some of the, uh, <clears throat> from the acylins or Acipro or the patinase. Um, again, with any uh, antihistamines or any nasal sprays, rather, um, depending on technique and, uh, and, and how you use them, there's always risks of, of nosebleeds. Um, but for the most part, the, the, the nasal sprays as the antihistamines um, are pretty safe to use, um, and they can also be pretty effective. And so um, we use those pretty often, and, uh, and we're pretty uh, confident that the side effect profile is pretty small. So this will be our last question. Uh, should I be using saline uh, for my nose instead of blowing my nose into a tissue when I'm having an allergy attack? Uh, that question, I, I don't have any preference. I don't know if you do, Dr. Ameth, about that. Um, basically, I do recommend that my patients who do suffer from irritation of their nose, that they try, even if they don't have sinus disease, but if they have rhinitis or irritation of the nose, that sometimes just washing out their nose can be very soothing. Um, and it may make you not want to blow your nose as much. Um, but if you feel the need to blow your nose, I don't hesitate or tell people no. not to blow their nose. Um, I sneeze a lot and sometimes for several minutes. Also, can allergies uh, cause uh, inflamed tonsils? Um, I don't have any opinion about that. Um, I, you know, if 
it, usually when you have an inflamed tonsil, it's usually because you have an infection of your tonsils. Um, but does it cause inflamed tonsils? No. As far as I know, there's no link of your allergies causing your tonsils. Now, you may, rather than having allergies, you may be, in fact, having symptoms that look like allergies, but maybe it's really a cold and you're actually having a cold. And in that situation, yes, your tonsils would be inflamed. So it it, it, it might be that we are, we're talking about the same symptoms, but actually a different diagnosis here, and, and hence why the confusion. Well, um, at this point, I'd like to thank all of you for um, making this webinar quite successful and very interactive. Um, if you have any questions, again, uh, feel free to uh, contact um, the, our website, memorialherman.org at uh, slash ENT. Or if you have specific allergy questions, I'm going to hand it to Dr. Ameth, and he can view, give you his contact information. Uh, again, I'm a part of, uh, of a large group here in Houston called Allergy and Asthma Associates. Um, depending on where uh, everybody is located, we have offices pretty much around um, the Houston area. And so um, I work pr predominantly at the, at the Fannin office, which is here in the, in the medical center. Um, and I also go to uh, the Clear Lake area a couple times a week. And so I do think we probably have an office uh, somewhere um, out there for everybody. So hope everybody enjoyed. And uh, again, uh, if you have any additional questions, again, come see us.